Hello there, it's Chris Schmidt from Rocket Lasso, and welcome to a What's New video inside of Cinema 4D. Now, it's only been 63 days since we got the last new version, which was 2023, and now we've got a point one release on top of that. We've got some quality of life improvements, some tweaks to the modeling tools, and a huge new feature with Pyro, which I've been showing examples of here already. So let's jump into Cinema 4D 2023.1. I'm in a new scene file. I'll begin by creating a disk primitive, change the rotation segments to 12 because we are going to model a snowflake. Make this editable and let's go to edge mode and I want to play with symmetry, but there's a new type of symmetry. Selecting the symmetry hub, I'll pin that so it doesn't disappear and I would like to activate symmetry and there's a new mode called radial. Now it's actually really straightforward. There's not too many settings, so we don't have to spend too much time on this because it's going to be pretty intuitive for anybody who's already played with the symmetry tools that were introduced in the previous version. So let's make sure we turn on show plane so we can actually get a little preview of what we're seeing. And to begin with, I'll say don't mirror. So there are six different spokes here, which are going to allow us to do a symmetry selection and modeling commands on whatever we've currently got selected. So with edge mode selected, I will say I want to select this edge here. Hit the letter D for extrude. I'll pull these out, hold down shift until it tilts over. Get exactly 90 degrees, push those out a little bit further. Let's weld those together. So MQ, and that should weld those two points together into a single point. Maybe still in edge mode, I'll select both these edges and you'll see that the radial selection is allowing it to spin all the way around. MF for a edge cut, apply that, put a few of those in there. And then I'll do a simple selection of some of these edges here, alternating every other one. D for extrude, I'll push those all out and then we get kind of a nice snowflake spiraling out. But all the modeling tools will work here. We could do additional selections where, let's see, what should I do? Let's do a couple of point selections here just to make maybe that a little bit smaller. You see that those will actually scale from that center point, but it's being applied everywhere. And then even something like an edge selection from that side to that one, you're going to see that the equivalent selection has been applied everywhere. So now if I do a bridge tool, B for bridge, you bridge from one to the other and that will apply everywhere. Let's do that on the next one. Select this edge and this edge, B for bridge, connect those. And once again, perfectly spiraling all the way around, in this case, doing six different sides, enabling us to make a six-sided snowflake, which all snowflakes are. Opening up a new file, let's pop that back open again, Symmetry Hub, activate it, show the planes, go to radial. And in this case, I'll create a tube. And with the tube, I think it's set up to work pretty well already. I'll jump this up to 24 subdivisions, and I want that hub to stay, so I'll pin that making our tube editable. I'll go to polygon mode and now we can see that we're back to selecting six slices, which is good. We want something that's divisible by the current count of 24. And we also have mirror turned on. So I would like to play with that. But to begin with, you'll see if I move around these different symmetry planes, it's going to select exactly that polygon. And we can select more than one. If I hit the letter I for inner extrude, it's going to have those Combine selections, shrink down, the, they will stay grouped. D for extrude, those will all push down. The typical thing when you're doing some sort of radial symmetry is always making a hubcap or a tire. So it's essentially what we've got going on here. But they can be pushed a little bit further by doing something like mirror. So if I say mirror, you'll see we get sort of the secondary selection. If I select just one of these, activating mirror. Now, if I move up to do a selection, you'll see that not only is it selecting the singular polygon, but it'll mirror onto the other side of the plane as well. So both of those get selected at the same time. And again, if I were to do an inner extrude, they'll both push in. D for extrude, they'll both push down as if there was a single selection. So very handy along those lines. All the other settings, pretty straightforward. We can do a radial offset by a particular degree if we want to match a slightly different angle. And we've got the source slice, which we can offset which is the active selection of which one of these we're kind of beginning with. So yeah, pretty straightforward, but a great addition. It's something that when you need this tool, you're really going to need it. So very handy that we have access to this now. Moving on, we've got a small tweak to a tool, but something that I find very handy. It's actually something that I have been requesting. We'll start out real simple. I, I'm going to go through these as quick as possible because we're going to be spending a lot of time on pyro. So simple sphere, make it editable, make a 
selection here, U F for a fill selection, and I'll even do another loop up there and delete that. So we got sphere with a couple holes in it. Now, if we go to the close polygon hole tool, which the shortcut for that is M D is going to open close polygon hole, you'll see there's a new button. There is close all holes. So if I click on that, it's actually going to close the hole on the top and the one on the bottom, whichever mode we're currently in. I can change this over to grid mode, click close all holes, and now it's going to be closing those holes with the grid mode. Now, there's actually a new mode. Instead of grid, we can jump over to patch. If I were to close this hole, then now it's going to seal it just like we had before. But before, kind of wherever that patch was applied, it was stuck that way. But now we can rotate the patch. So if I increase this number, you see that this patch will spin around. As long as we have a compatible number of edges for these to spin, it will automatically spin them around, which is very, very nice. Definitely something I had been requesting. And then we've got a patch width. So I'll zero out patch rotation. Patch width is going to stretch out the selections. You'll see right now we've got four down, one, two, three, four, and four across, one, two, three, four. But I can say, actually, change the patch width so now there's one less. I can do it again, and there's another one less on each side. So now we've got these stretched out polygons still creating quads, but closing it in a very different and cleaned up way. And that also can be rotated around until you get the angle that you want. So some nice additions to the close polygon hole tool. Into a new scene file, I need to create some sort of model. So I'll say I want a cube. And here is some quality of life changes. If we right click on this model, then we get access to our tags as we always have. But now if I were to say move into our rigging tags, you can see that there is a tear bar on here. I can tear that menu off and it can exist independent of that drop down. So if you're doing a bunch of rigging with a character. Now you can get the tags hanging out there, whichever object we have selected, these will get applied. And it's really easy now to make a menu item out of this if you wanted to. Right clicking on this, I can fold my palette, which will collapse these all down. If I click and hold, we get access to all of those. And then right clicking and saying customize palettes, I could drop this anywhere into my menu, anywhere I want. So in this case, let's put it right there. Close down the command manager. And now that is going to be existing up in this top bar. So selecting and holding down on that, I get access to all of my rigging tags. Just a cool little addition, something simple. I will get rid of that, double click on it, and it'll erase it out when that menu is open. And a very similar thing, if you go to your file dropdown, go to export, you can also tear this off. So if you're doing a bunch of exporting, exporting files, you can keep this torn off or again, dock this somewhere. I could dock this right here and now I get quick access to all of those. If I want to reset, I can always click back on standard layout and it's back to my default. So just, you know, something simple, but it is nice to have access to that. Next up are some tweaks to mostly Redshift and how the way it interacts with Cinema 4D's viewport. So let's move on over into a scene file I've got right here and a couple different things to talk about out of the gate. So I've got this warehouse scene set up and it's made with Redshift materials and it's using the new Redshift camera. If I hit play, you're gonna see that there is a very simple camera animation that is just passing through here. So it's ready to go. But you see, because of how complicated the scene is, I think I have a lot of bools. It's not running too well here. So I wanna send this out to the picture viewer. Now, in the previous versions, if I was setting this whole scene up with Redshift, then you know, it's gonna look a particular way. We've got these Redshift materials, but if you shifted this over to your viewport renderer, cause you wanna get maybe a real-time playback or a play blast, it would shift back to standard renderer. But now it's like, oh, you were doing Redshift? We will keep it in Redshift. So now sending this out to the picture viewer, I don't even need to save. Let's just say, hey, send that out to the picture viewer now. And that is going to render out picture viewer wise, frame by frame, but still use the Redshift lighting and the Redshift materials in the viewport. So simplifies that and is really gonna open up a lot of opportunities there. So you can see this plays through. And now that I've got that pretty much done, I can preview that in real time via the picture viewer. So excellent. Moving on is a bunch of little changes when it comes to the way Redshift materials show up here in the viewport. So let's begin with, let's make a plane object and chain, I'll just pull it up in the air, that's fine. So we'll subdivide that a couple extra times, 55 by 55. So as you hopefully know from the previous version, you can now put vertex maps on parametric objects. So if I right click and say, I would like a other vertex map tag, we can, while it's parametric, still manipulate it with fields. So creating a spherical field fall off, let's, hit T for scale, scale that up, and I got a nice big spherical gradient on that. So if I move into my materials, 
I am currently in Redshift. Keep in mind, always important to change this to Redshift, or I think it would work right now because it's remembering that we were in Redshift. But I'll go to Redshift as my renderer, meaning if I create a new material, if I double click, that will make a Redshift standard material automatically for me. So I'll apply that. So with that material applied, I can move inside this node editor to manipulate my standard material in Redshift. I would like to make that vertex map. So let's search for that. Search for vertex attribute. And I will link that directly into my color channel of my standard material. Link this to a vertex map. And now in the viewport, we're instantly seeing that vertex map. This will work with the color vertex map as well. So that's really powerful. And it's actually really important for a bunch of the pyro stuff that we're going to see in a little bit. In addition to that, we can feed something like the vertex attribute through the ramp. So if I search for our ramp, and if you didn't know, you can drag that directly from your search onto a wire and it will actually interject it in between those two. So now I've got this ramp and I can say, you know what? I want to invert this gradient and you'll see that will flip to the other side. I could change the colors on here. Let's go with a crazy bright pink. So now we're going from bright pink to black showing up directly there in the viewport. So very handy there. Next up is, let's, um, what's a good way of setting this up? Actually, I'll just delete these and we'll continue on this plane here. I would like to bring in a material. So let me open up a menu. I'll grab my file explorer here and I got a whole bunch of different images, a little almost like animation set up here of all these arcs. I'll drag one of them in. So there it is. And I can output that to the color. We should see that show up here in the viewport. But now if I were to say, hey, show this as an animation, change the mode to simple, and I can click, it's already set, but you can always click detect frames. And now it's like, oh, it's gonna make an animation, 30 frames, because that's what the scene file is. And there are 40 pictures, so it's going from zero to 39. So we have an animation now. So if you select your main material, very important, turn on animate preview. Now, if I scrub my timeline and jump around, we're going to see, oops, let me de-link from that camera. So now if I scrub to a different time, you're going to see that we are seeing that update here in the viewport. So we can now play through some different animated textures. Now I'll swap this image out for a image with some color in it. And there we go. And now that should update. So let's turn off the animation. So now I've got an image with some color in it. So now you'll see if I do something, I like create a color correct node interject that in there. Now, if I do things like change my gamma, it'll update there in the viewport. We can also change, well, we can change all these things. We can change the hue and we can change our saturation. So those are able to be shown in the viewport. Something important to note is I think you, you can't layer up multiple ones of this. Like we only have one right now. It'd be great to have more than one, but for now, I think if I were to make another color correct, let's find out. The second one, if I do another hue, you see that one's not going to update. So it's only going to see the first one. So I'll delete both of those. And it does work with a couple other things as well. Like you saw, our vertex maps can be fed in there. We can also do a composite node. So if I make a color composite, add that in as the base. And let's make a color input. And we'll drop that in as a color. What color would I like? Well, let's just make it, I don't know, a nice bright red. So now if I say, hey, take those two colors and multiply them on top of each other, feed that through, that will also be fed through successfully and we'll see it there in the viewport. So yeah, a couple of nodes that will now refresh accurately inside of your viewport thanks to this improved node editor and better Redshift integration. So now that we've talked about all of that stuff, let's Now let's talk about the new Redshift camera. So let me zoom up a little bit, create a camera. Keep in mind, I'm currently in Redshift in my render settings, very important, because that will change your interface here. But now if I create a camera and zoom out, you can see I've got a new type of camera. Even the little icon here looks completely different than the regular camera, just to distinguish between the two. So instead of having to make a Redshift camera tag, there's now a Redshift camera. So everything's been integrated along with a couple of additional options. So let's take a look. We've got our main tab. And with this, and let's actually go to that POV. We can 
represent, we can do some near clipping and some far clipping, which will actually clip things out of the scene as I increase this. Things will start getting chopped away. We can also activate our far plane. If I go to the top view, we can see if I increase my depth, you see that that's represented here. Here's our outer one represented. And if we go to our display, I can turn on the focus plane as well. Activating that, you're gonna see that that is our focus plane. So moving into optical, I could say, hey, what's our focal distance? Let's say 500, and that will move forward. And now in the viewport, we can see represented how far away our focal plane is. We can change the opacity of that, dropping this way down if you want just a little bit or a little bit more, change it to any color that you want. In addition, we can do things like turn on those compositions, which was already inside the standard camera, but I, I like this interface a lot better here. We can do things like activate a grid or a golden spiral and twirling this down, you get additional options for mirroring them around. So yeah, nice having access, easy access to all of those things. So I'll turn those off. And then where do we have it? Yeah, yeah, display. So currently it says this camera is only gonna show all the extra details while it's selected. If I de-link from the camera, you can see I have it selected and we're seeing our near plane and our far plane and our actual focus plane. But if I deselect the camera, now all we get is the widget showing where the camera is and all the other stuff isn't eating up all that space in the viewport. Select it again and it will show up. Now you can change that to be off, so it's always off, or you can say it's always on, just like kind of classic cinema would be. But I find that new default very, very handy. And then we can move over, let's link to the camera again. Here's something that is pretty handy. I'll turn off the focus plane for now. Something that is handy, let's focus in on the word viewport here. And let me turn off that near and far. So there is a new fit option here and we are able to change this to a bunch of different modes. The interesting ones for me are fit crop and overscan fit. And let me just activate it and show you what it looks like. So now that I've got fill crop, if I open up my render settings and I change the ratio that I've got here, it is gonna be way more cooperative about the way it's cropping in your viewport. So just watch as I grab my width and I start shrinking it in. So you now see that that will shrink in further and further and further, but like my aspect ratio isn't changing. Like it's, it, I don't know, it feels a little more intuitive there to me. We also stretch it further and now you're gonna see that that is cropping in very nicely. I feel like, you know, that's pretty intuitive. And then moving from fit to overscan fit, it's going to be similar, but a little bit different. I'm not even sure how to describe it, just that this is more intuitive to me. You'll see as I shrink this in, my viewport isn't updating. It's not moving anything. It's just changing where the crop is. So very handy there and we can do the opposite. So start stretching this wider. And now you see it's staying consistent and we're just chopping in. So if you're doing the TikTok crop version of what you are rendering out, you can crop in without the entire screen squishing really small. So, you know, again, something that's pretty handy there. Jump this back up to 1920. And then the last thing I want to focus on when it comes to the Redshift camera is we can jump to, we've got these different perspective types. Currently I'm in perspective, but I could say, hey, show me a fisheye lens. And this will show up right here in the viewport very quickly. Now it's important to note that this is an effect kind of at render time. It's modifying the camera. So you couldn't do things like modeling or anything in this mode. You'd have to go back to your perspective for that. But this is going to actually show your final camera right there in the viewport. So we got a couple different modes in here. So there's our spherical, which can be super trippy, uh, like increasing, actually that's probably maxed out. But yeah, we can shrink that down and make it less fisheye or go way out. We've also got spherical, which is gonna push this even further. We're seeing everything in the entire scene. It can get pretty trippy here, like when you start traveling through some models, because they'll suddenly move entirely behind you. So that can be cool. And then you've got cylindrical mode, which isn't gonna look different out of the gate, but now we get access to a couple different settings. So we could say that we're only seeing a smaller portion of that. So we don't have to see the entire sphere essentially, and we can pull back on both of the angle views. And lastly, we could change it to stereo spherical. That will not show up in the viewport, but it will show up once you go and render that out. Probably worth mentioning is if you open up a legacy file, I think I have one handy, so let me track that down. 
up a layer and here's the redshift camera from the old files so you'll see that this will still come in with the old camera tag but essentially we don't have access to the camera tag anymore so that will be living in your scene file it won't break but if you want let's say you're going to copy all the stuff go into let me make sure i'm in model mode copy this stuff go into a new file paste it if you were to you know continue and you want to update everything you can click your camera tag there and say actually update to the redshift camera object and that should transfer your settings over to this redshift camera now keep in mind your old cinema 4d camera if we're in standard renderer which i am right now you can still click your camera and you're still going to get the old camera here i'm still dealing from it you'll still have the old icon so all the stuff is still there but now we have a redshift camera getting rid of the tag just making it a little bit more intuitive and all the tools bundled directly into that into a new scene file we can open up our asset browser and search for the word backdrop and here's a brand new capsule primitive to create backdrops for you so let's get rid of that take a look at a couple of these settings hitting nb we can see the geometry layout change the width change the height we've got some depth there we can extend the bottom and then change the rounding here in the corner and then we've got a handy tilt backward and even forward and a drop to turn this into an s psych or pull it upward to make it a u shape and then an overhang along the top which also can go negative so lots of kind of like almost every type of site you can think of can be generated here already set up in the asset browser finally we got subdivisions for the curve and we can change the subdivisions on the length and a couple of different uv modes i don't know let's just create a quick material here and i will drop in a tile material drop that on and let's check out we've got fill contain the uvs cover the entire thing and look at it via the tiling size so we could change the tiling that way so yeah got some nice uv setup ready to go on that as well close that and delete the backdrop we've got two other capsules that have been made and i can search for the word fui or fui and there is now the star spline so a spline primitive that has do this very quickly we got a couple different settings here for changing the radius we can change the thickness of those arms change the number of sides involved in it and add some rounding to it so some nice primitive shapes that can be made from that and pairing with that very nicely is the fui ring so another sort of motion graphics tool it's going to create a bunch of different arcs and we can change the number of these arcs we can change the overall radius and the gaps in between them and then things like adding rounding the start or end angle and then you get some animation on top of it so i can say hey loop over the course of 90 frames hit play and i see this animated and it's going to get cropped out wherever you did your start or end angle in addition to that you can change the size and add thickness variation so kind of a fun you know fui element to create more different um, graphics elements and interfaces and futuristic techie looking things so i'll have a couple more examples of this in the future because this is actually one that we built over here at rocket lasso for maxon and there'll be some example scene files for you to check out for that as well but now why don't we jump into the main event i will close down all these files and now to the thing we've all been waiting for and that is the all new pyro system inside of the unified simulations in cinema so there is a lot of settings to talk about so why don't we begin by moving on into a new scene file when it comes to pyro there are quite a few different settings but the good thing is the basics are very basic it's very simple to get into Let's begin with some simple geometry. I'll start with a sphere. And on that sphere, add a simulation pyro tag. And let's zoom out a bit, hit play. And there we go. We have now got fire and we've got smoke. And even cooler is I can grab the sphere and move it around here in the viewport and move this fireball all around the place. So very straightforward. This looks amazing right here in the viewport. I'm getting very nice playback for how complicated the actions we're seeing in the scene are. So that is wonderful right out of the gate in addition to that we can do things like create another sphere i'll move this one up into the air a bit and add a simulation collider tag the same collider that we use for the rope and the soft body and the cloth hitting play now we've now got the fire and the smoke going but i can now crash through it with 
the sphere and it's actually creating kind of you know it's creating like aerodynamics and the forces as this pushes through everything will move along with it so once again very straightforward very simple to use this next up let's talk about a very important setting inside of the tag and that is where are we emitting from we're currently emitting smoke and we're emitting fire and we'll go over those settings in a little bit this is a very important setting to talk about the surface emitter we are currently emitting from the surface from inside and out of your polygons by 10 units so like 20 thick let me show you that by changing our sphere to a hemisphere rotate that 90 degrees and hit play and you'll see especially in these first couple frames that we've got flames kind of all along the surface and if we let continue playing it's going to have fire blow all over the place but we could change that to turn off surface emitter which now means it treats it as a volume in this case this is a volume that's got a big hole in it but it's going to attempt to close any holes in your model so you'll see here if i go one frame forward that the entire volume has filled up with fire and there isn't any on the surface so very important to keep in mind the difference between surface and volume but from here on out i'll just refer this to like the volume of fire because and it's a good way of thinking of it because we are creating a volume of fire even with surface thickness it's just a volume that's only a thin skin that in this case would be 10 outside 10 inside so a thickness of 20 a volume of 20. so keep that in mind now something important to note i'll turn that back off again so we're dealing with volumes if i play there's a big volume of fire flying around we can create a spline make a circle here t for scale and just drag the tag over to it but in this case we're saying well we're generating this from the volume but splines don't have volume so if i play nothing happens but if i change this to yes use the surface emitter it's now creating a radius of 10 around the entire thing meaning kind of a tube that would be 20 thick hitting play now we get fire from the entire spline which is wonderful that gives us so many more options and so much more control over different rigs we want to build to make fire if we can use splines so this is a great addition that splines work right out of the gate in the first version of pyro rewinding let's go and reset a bunch of things we'll be resetting often because i want to stay on the defaults as much as possible while we're stepping through all of these so reset transform i'll even put the sphere back to our default so let's start stepping through some of the settings inside of pyro now Something that's very important to note is when I created that pyro tag, it also created this pyro object. So this object came along for the ride. So let's take a look at all the settings that are included, starting with the tag. Select the tag, and I've already got everything twirled down. You'll see that we have a bunch of tag properties up on the top. Very important. Density, which is smoke. Think of density as smoke. We've got temperature, which is the fire. There's fuel, which can burn and create temperature and density. We've also got velocity, which would be taking on the speed of an object passing through it or taking on the velocity of the main object moving around. And then there's noise, which essentially creates uh, holes in that generation. Why don't I show you that right away? Because it's a good spot to. If I say play right here at the very beginning, do you see how like this pocket didn't have any fire in it? That's because of noise. Put noise down to zero and rewind, hit play. And you see the entire surface is covered. So this is an animated noise traveling through your volume that is saying, hey, add a little variation to the condition that we were constantly getting cool puffs of smoke and fire. But you always turn that off just by saying noise strength zero. So getting that one out of the way, let's look at the settings included inside this pyro object. Selecting that, we've got everything twirled down here. And as I scroll down, you're going to see we've got a lot of settings included in there. And I will say I have used almost every single one of these settings and every single one of these settings is doing something important. So we can't, you know, this isn't something that can be super simplified. Luckily, most of the time, most of these settings can be ignored. But if you're trying to do very specific things, then you do have to learn these. Now, very important thing to note, whenever you create a pyro tag, it will create this pyro object. But what this pyro object is in the most basic sense is we've got this main tab. And this is going to say, what is it actually generating when it comes to rendering or exporting? So in this case, it would be on export, say on render. It would be exporting the density and the temperature and the velocity. Everything else, it's not worried about. But we are able to export those. Also, this can cache all of the pyro. 
And then we've got the Pyro tab, which has all of the settings I was showing you. When it comes to this tab, all this is is a mirror of your project settings. So if I say Control or Command D, we can go under Simulation in your project settings. And if you go, you know, make sure you're in Pyro tab, inside of here, here's those same settings existing in a second place. So really, in a lot of ways, this tag is here to be convenient so that you can quickly get access to the global settings instead of constantly going into your project settings. But yeah, and they are mirrored. So if I were to change, say, this voxel size to 15, jump back into this object, you'll see that has also changed to 15. We're not going to get into it now, maybe a little bit later, but there are very good reasons to make multiple pyro objects that are potentially doing different exports. But you can also make different pyro objects that would have different properties, like some, maybe you got some flame on one side that's got like a lot of detail and you've got some fire in a different spot and that's got very low detail. So you can make more than one. We're not gonna worry about that, but keep in mind that that is a thing. Let's, I know, okay, so that's kind of scaring you with how many different settings there are. So I showed you, you can use it really simple. Now there's a ton of settings. Now let's start walking through it and try and see if I can make them reasonable. Moving into the main pyro tag, there's a whole bunch of things going on. Like here's the density, which is smoke, as I said, and temperature and fuel and velocity. In the beginning, I thought all these things were just completely linked to each other. But you can actually think of these things completely separate from each other, which actually makes it a lot easier to learn. For instance, you would think that you can't have smoke without fire, but you totally can. If I turn off temperature and hit play, we now get just a ball of smoke and it rises very slowly because of the settings that are built in. But yeah, we get just smoke. We can turn off density and say only temperature. And now the smoke is gone and now we just get nice simple flame coming off of it. We'll talk about fuel a little bit later. It is very important, but we'll wait on that for a little bit. We've also got things like the velocity. Like right now, the velocity is set to follow the movement of the object as it exists, but we could decouple that as well. But let's step through these very carefully and slowly. Let's step through on temperature because it's the most simple of all of them. And just to show you, we can even turn off this velocity just so, look, there's nothing going on here except temperature is being generated. Now to me, I thought temperature, you know, it needed some sort of fuel. And that would mean maybe this object is burning. But no, that's not the way this works at all. We are creating a whole bunch of voxels. And right now we've got our voxel size. And let's visualize that. I can do that by going to my project settings or into the pyro object. I'll scroll all the way to the bottom. And this is something you don't have to do. But I can turn on to draw my tree structure. And when I hit play, we're going to suddenly see a whole bunch of different boxes get drawn on here. We got these different cells. Each of these is storing information about the simulation. And what's cool about this system, in the past, a lot of different systems would be able to do this type of thing, but you'd have to draw like a big box and the simulation was trapped inside the box. This system is more advanced where it's actually creating the boxes dynamically as they are needed. Couple of rules of thumb here. The more boxes there are, the slower your simulation is going to be because each box is storing a whole bunch of different information about velocities and densities and the direction things are flowing and the temperature, like there's a lot of information being stored. And the sheer number of them is going to make things slow down. When it comes to something like temperature, it doesn't actually need fire to be represented. All it needs is one of these voxels, one of these boxes to be hot enough. If it's hot enough, it can now be represented as having flame. So right now you'll see that I've also got this in here volume to draw and in the viewport it's drawing the shaded view. And that means we're seeing essentially the temperature and the smoke all combined into one. So essentially all that fire is, is some of these voxels being hot enough to be represented and get drawn. Like they cross a certain threshold, which means they're, they're drawn. There's a fire gradient being mapped onto it and it's gotten hot enough for it to be mapped. So all we have to do is add heat and that means we see fire. So with more heat, we'll see more fire more rapidly and it'll take longer for it to dissipate because it will have been hotter. Let's turn off this tree structure and look at some of the temperature stuff. Hitting play, once again, we've got our basic fire. Moving into the tag, which is gonna be where you change most of your kind of properties of you know how much, well, you, you can see right here, we've got temperature. Let's simplify. We've got the set temperature, which means the entire volume is being set automatically to exactly 4,000. And 4,000 definitely gets visualized here. We've also got add. What add does is over the course of one second, it'll add that amount of temperature. So let's simplify. I'll get rid of set, and now all we're doing is slowly adding a little bit of heat. 
So you can see there's not much, but if we zoom up, there is a little bit of heat here and it is getting visually represented. So that would render, we've got a little kind of smoldering amount of temperature. But we could crank that up and say, hey, there's even more heat being added every frame. But keep in mind, and we'll see it, the settings for it later, but there's temperature being pulled out every single frame. So now we are hitting sort of an equilibrium where this temperature will get added together and then drift upward and fade away because the temperature is now dropped below the point, below the threshold in which it can be mapped on the gradient that would be seen in the viewport. So that's a good way of thinking about temperature. The simplest way to do this is don't worry about add. We can just set the temperature to a certain thing in a certain spot. So in this case, it'll just be a nice fireball in one little area and it'll explode upward until the temperature fades away enough to cease to exist and it just disappears. All right, so that is a very basic example of what's going on with separating out temperature as a concept. Something that I think is maybe even more fun than temperature is density. And again, I've been thinking of this like smoke. So if we hit play, uh, we are now generating smoke with no temperature. So there's a certain density is being mapped and it's a, another thing that has to hit a certain threshold, which could then be visualized. But there's a couple of cool things. Hitting play, we can move this around. Ooh, let me grab a correct object. I can move this around and we'll be creating a big cloud that we can draw anywhere that we like. This could be being mapped onto a spline and just drawing on the spline. We got different settings. We could be blowing the smoke around, having it fade away more quickly. We could be throwing different forces on here. Oh, we didn't even talk about that. Um, I almost, I kind of jumped right over it, but it's important to note, even in the very basic thing, I know we're getting fancier here, but in the most basic form, you can, oops, let me turn, not fuel, temperature back on. So we've got our fireball going in. We can also use regular forces on the simulation system, on the pyro system. So if I were to create a turbulence, you have to, you, you know, let's start with wind. It doesn't get much more simple than that. So I'm blowing wind on a positive X. Now you actually need the strength to be pretty dang high. So what I've found is if you go up to about 500, you're definitely going to feel the effect. You can now feel the wind definitely blowing. And I guess here, it's, that's plenty strong. You definitely see the wind blowing in that direction. But sometimes you have to go as high as like 5,000 to like really be sure that it's happening. So let me show you, getting rid of wind. Let's instead use turbulence. So with turbulence going, if I play, right now we're five, we're not gonna see much. Let's add some scale. So we actually see so co some coherent turbulence. But if we go up to 55, I'm gonna, Let's rewind. You're going to see, I don't really see an effect. Like there is one, but I don't really see it. If we go up to 500, around 500, like I said, now I think you're going to see a bit of it. There, you can definitely see, okay, there's a little extra cut right there that's traveling up. So around 500 definitely gives you an effect. If you want to be sure something's working, go up to around 5,000. At 5,000, you're going to see, let's rewind, that it's like, okay, definite effect. It's, def I would say, stylistically going to be too powerful. 500 kind of a good minimum, 5,000 is push the limit to make sure it's actually doing something. If you know my workflow, it's always like, okay, push it too far. Okay, cool, I know this is too strong, so maybe I want a third of that so I can make a better estimate. So anyway, uh, that works with turbulence and also it's really great. We can use field forces right out of the gate and I've definitely been using these a bunch. So let's do something simple. I'll throw this circle spline into the field force and I'll crank this offset up all the way. And you'll see here, it's getting cropped in a bit, but it's creating a circular force around the entire thing, which should try to spin the fire around. Hitting play. By default, five, we're not gonna see much. So let's jump it up right away to five, five, five. And then you see these are stronger and I can definitely feel a little bit of rotation starting to go on there. But if we jump up to around 5,000, rewind, definitely really strong. You blatantly feel that. So, you know, you get an idea of that, but we'll get, into some more specifics on that later. All right, zooming back in again. We were talking about temperature. Let's move into density. Now, like I said, in some ways, I like density more than I like the temperature because it's just really fun to play with like the smoke. Hitting a play, you can see that it's generating some white density. If we add even like way more density, it's gonna get darker and darker and darker because of how dense it is. So at 10 times the strength, it starts getting very dark gray. If we give it another 10 up to a thousand, then you're gonna see it's gonna be almost black. It's so dense. But there's also this color setting, which is wonderful. If I add in on the color, let's go pink, hit play, it is now generating pink smoke, which is super crazy. Let's rewind, record the color 
pink at the beginning. Let's go to the halfway point and I'll say this is shifted over to a red color. Let's go to the end and say that's shifted over to a yellow color. So now if I hit play, this is now going to generate pink smoke and I'll start moving this around and you'll see my keyframe colors are actually transitioning in onto the emission of the smoke, of the density, and it's actually creating these crazy smoke colors. I'd like to show that these things really can be decoupled from each other. Let's kill off those keyframes here and put this back to default even. And let's reset the PSR, put that back to zero. If I play, then we're gonna get a simple cloud of smoke slowly drifting upward. Now, what if I make a cube and we'll move this up into the air just a little bit. And on my cube, uh, I want it to not get in our way. So I'll say I want a render display tag use lines. So you, you see the box represented, but it's not getting in our way. So with this box, I'm going to say I want it to have some property of pyro. I will right click and say it'll get a pyro tag, but it won't generate density and it won't generate temperature. But I can say it'll generate some velocity. So let's say that this will add to the velocity. And once again, I don't know what a good number will be. So let's go up to 10,000. So we've got X, Y, Z. Let's say we're going to do this on X. So it's going to go the direction of positive X and it's going to have a strength of 10,000. So that is now just on this box. If I rewind and hit play, the smoke slowly drifts upward. And now as soon as it begins touching this box, it's suddenly getting blasted off to the right. This box now has the property of velocity when it comes to the pyro system. But we're not limited to that. I could also say, you know what? This box also, let's say that's a little bit strong. So we'll drop this down to about 2000. But I'll say that this box also has a property of having a density of yellow. Rewind all the way. And now we have white smoke being emitted. But when it touches this box, it's going to change to yellow and then get blown off to the side. Look at these really great swirls and vortexes that we're getting from there. Like, uh, so, so good. So this box could do many different things. It's all decoupled. So given this setup, why don't we say that our original sphere is going to not emit smoke. It'll emit temperature. So we'll get the regular fire going. If I have play, you're going to see that drifts up and that wind is pushing it to the right. I think the fire is a little more aggressively pushing upward. So it doesn't blow off the side quite as much. We could increase that amount if we wanted to see it. So yeah, that's a little bit harder on X, but only while it's in the box. But we have the option of doing things like not modifying the density, but let's change the temperature. So don't set because we don't want to just fill it with a volume of temperature. But instead, let's say we are going to start subtracting some temperature from it. Now, I'm going to go huge. Keep in mind that add happens over the course of 30 frames. So it's 1 30th of the power hitting play here. Now, as the fire starts to go inside, you can see that it starts fading away way more quickly. If I turn that box off, you're going to see that this fire wants to continue upward for quite some time. But we are now sucking temperature out when the fire is actually inside this box. So again, these properties are decoupled from each other. Think of them completely separately. Anyway, I think that's a good overview of the basics of the idea of density and temperature. Let's take a look at fuel because fuel is pretty cool. We need to emit some sort of fuel. So let's start simple. I'll create a plane object, move this up in the air. I'll even shrink it, but make X a little bit longer. And let's push this off to the side. Okay, so we've got this long platform. I want this also, uh, let's turn off the sphere temporarily on this plane, I'll right click and say simulation pyro. You could click pyro fuel, but let's just do it manually. I'll say pyro. Currently it's generating density. I don't want that. Generating temperature. I don't want that. Generating fuel. Yes, please. So we've turned that on. If I play right now, we're not going to see much. In fact, we're not going to see anything, but there is simulation happening. We need to visualize it. So a way of visualizing it would be going to your pyro, scrolling pyro object that is scrolling all the way to the bottom. I'm going to say, I don't want to draw the shaded view. And that's what we're seeing with the density and the fire. I want to see the fuel. So now rewinding and play, you can see that this entire plane is now generating fuel. Okay. So that's generating fuel with a certain thickness on all the edges. So it's 20 thick total. Let's reactivate our, I'll turn off the fuel turn on our sphere and this is going to create a giant fireball just because of, uh, you know, we've got some temperature here. Oh, and we're currently, yeah, be careful. I'm currently visualizing fuel control D 
Let's go back, scroll down and say, that's got to go back to shaded. Otherwise, I won't see anything. So now we're still generating this giant fireball. I'm going to shrink that down. T for scale, shrink that way down. And what I want to get is a smaller flame. That's pretty small, but let's go even smaller. Just enough to generate a little bit of fire. Okay, that should work fine. So now I've got a tiny flame. Let's create this plane. And that should be enough to do the setup. Hitting play. Now this fire will go up. And when it touches that fuel, suddenly that fuel is igniting. And not only is it igniting, it's sort of exploding. You see we're getting a giant fireball. And this is now traveling across the entire thing. So that's fuel, very powerful going across. And that's just sort of the default settings that we've got here. But you can think of fuel very differently here. Fuel is storing energy that could then expand and sort of explode out to smoke and fire. So let's make this a little bit more reasonable, maybe, and grab our fuel. And right now it's setting the fuel to 10. Let's drop it to like one tenth that amount. Maybe even that's still too much, but let's say one tenth the amount. And let's see what we get. That's still quite a bit. We're still getting a fireball, but it's not a absurd fireball. So yeah, there's one tenth of fuel, but using small decimals here is not a bad thing. We say 0.1. So again, one tenth of the amount. Let the flame just go boop, and there you go. And now you can see that we've got a nice, small, kind of smoldering flame traveling across the entire thing. And it's actually mostly smoke. There's not enough fuel here to create a lot of fire. So yeah, that's fuel. We can now completely separately have an object generate some fuel. But all of these things can be combined into one. Let's almost, actually, let's just start over. I'll delete everything, create a brand new sphere, add the pyro back in. And if I play right now, you're going to see we're back to getting fire and smoke. But we could put fuel in here as well. If I turn on fuel, this is also generating fuel, which will instantly catch on fire. And now you see we get a fireball immediately because the fuel had an ignition source and the whole thing's expanding outward. And we've got a lot of fuel, which is going to keep on generating more and more temperature. And thus we get a lovely fireball right out of the gate. If we zoom out, this is like a proper explosion that we're getting. And this is going to just keep on producing that like every single frame. And this will keep on expanding, keep on traveling up. It's going to take a long time for all that temperature to dissipate. So yeah, very powerful here. Now that is a lot of the basics of the pyro setup. There's just a couple other things worth mentioning. There are... Let's talk about how to render and also the fact that under density and temperature and fuel, we have the ability to twirl it down and feed in a vertex map. So we could have temperature only applying in certain places. Why don't we do that? I'll turn off flame and density. We'll do a plane because it'll be the most easily visual. Adding in, let's say 55 by 55 and it gets the pyro tag. Right clicking, I can say simulation, actually not simulation, other vertex map. Remember in the previous version in 2023, we were able to put vertex maps on parametric objects, which is awesome. But let's make a random field. In the random field, I would like the scale to go up and up and up until we can very clearly see this plane. Gets some animation speed, hit play, and we should, let's turn off the pyro for a second. I'll just pull it off the model and select the vertex map and we should okay you see how that's animating around i want it to be way faster so i'll say 333 so yeah now we've definitely got that traveling around and i might remap this so i'll add a quick curve and start cropping this in and maybe even up a little bit so you can see i've got certain spots that are showing up really blatantly so now that i've got a vertex map on that i could say i want there to be temperature but the temperature will be limited to this vertex map so now as i hit play we should see, oh, let's put the tag back on the right spot, hit play, and now we're going to get fire, these areas suddenly getting set to this temperature. Now, I think it's turning into the temperature so quickly and fading away that it doesn't have a lot of time to travel upward. Also, keep in mind that I made this quite large, a lot larger than the sphere, so it's going to be a bit slower. Maybe I'll scale it down a bit. So now these different areas are going to be getting this applied, but... If these aren't getting enough time to get flame, I could always say, hey, that flame is even hotter. So let's jump this up to 8,000. So I've doubled the temperature here. So now when this suddenly lights up with fire, it's got more time to rise up into the air. So now flames are being generated very specifically where I want on a vertex map. And I've got a couple cool demos I'll be showing you in a little bit. They can do very, very advanced things with vertex maps. Finally, let's start over again. Let's add in a text object this time. Let's do pyro. Why not add on the simulation pyro tag? We want to hit play. 
It's going to generate our flame and our smoke. Let that play for a few frames. So we need this to render. First of all, let's do it in Redshift. If my computer will cooperate, which it doesn't always. With Redshift turned on, we need to apply some sort of material on here. What would that be? Well, let's jump into the Material menu. Create Redshift materials and we've got volume and we've also got pyro volume they're the exact same thing they've just got a couple settings tweaked so if i click on the pyro volume the only difference is you're going to see if i select it that it already has the word density fed in and it's already got the word temperature fed in at the appropriate spot beyond that they're identical but let me show you a problem if i let's zoom up on there why not if i open up our render viewer Pause that, hit go. You're gonna see, okay, we see the text, but there's no fire, why not? Well, the reason for that is this is set up to be as quick as possible in the viewport. So this is running very quickly, but there's a lot of data needed for the rendering that it's not generating for us. And that is why we've got this setting inside of the pyro object under object tab. We are currently on export going to have the details for the density and the temperature and the velocity. But we can say, no, no, I want to generate the density and the temperature right now in the viewport. So it will run slower if I rewind and hit play. It is now having to generate that extra data here. There's several reasons why you might, might want to. It does look a little bit different, but letting that play a little bit, now that data has actually been generated. So now if I hit play, we should probably apply the material. Let's <laughs> apply the material onto the pyro object, not to the thing generating the flame, but the actual final pyro object that's like the volume. Dropping the material on there, now we can instantly see that that will now render. Yeah, it'll look a little bit better if we put a dome light in here. Even without a material, you see the smoke is actually getting some illumination now. So yeah, there we go. You can now have it render in Redshift just by creating that pyro volume, dropping it on your pyro object, and making sure, very important, making sure that your object properties have been turned on for whichever ones are appropriate. Now, you might need to turn on additional ones or different ones. If you're playing with smoke and you're colorizing the smoke, then you're going to, going to need the color channel. So in that case, you need density and color instead. Potentially, you want to be visualizing the pressure or the fuel. So each channel is, you know, make sure you pick the correct one for your situation. All right, having done that, let me show you one last cool way of visualizing this stuff. We don't need that material anymore. Delete the dome. Now, what I'd like this to generate is, let's have it be just the temperature. So I'll say off and off, and now it's generating just the data for the temperature. Rewinding, we could even say, hey, don't worry about generating any density. So hitting play now, play a few frames again. There's no good way that I know of to not visualize both, but of course you don't need to play both at the same time all the time. I can put that back to on export let this play through and you see it's way quicker then. And then on the frame I wanna see, I can turn on the data and now that's being generated. So now that I've done that, let's add in a, not volume builder, but let's skip right over that and go to a volume mesher. Feeding our pyro object inside, I'll hide the pyro object. And now you can see I've got a bit of geometry there. Selecting the volume mesher, I can start changing our voxel range to look at different ranges of density. And by pulling this back, I can start to see all of those flames as geometry. Now, if I hit play, you're going to see it kind of disappears. Every time I pause, it'll pop back in again. You can fix that by going to Control or Command D, Simulation, Scene, and then click on Simulate Before Generators. So as long as that is turned on and hit play, it'll actually play in the viewport. So we're getting very nice playback here of actual geometry based off of this flame. So, and this could be keyframed and animated, any combination. This could be the smoke instead. There are so many different crazy combinations. So we're definitely going to be pushing these concepts a little bit further in some of the demo files, but I just wanted to show you two quick ways of actually visualizing and being able to render this. Why don't we do a couple of project files here just as a way of learning some of the more advanced pyro settings in more of a real world situation. So I've got a file ready for us here. And the goal is let's make a grease fire. And we're gonna make the grease fire at sort of the real world scale. If I make a figure, you can see that it's pretty much matching the stove. Here I've got a stove and a frying pan from the asset browser. And the only other two things I've got here are and that's gonna be where our grease fire comes from. And then I made a collider based on some of the geometry from this pot, and it has a collider tag. So besides that, this stuff is straight out of the asset browser. 
So let's make sure we place this grease. I don't want to go too far down. I'm going to go up a little bit in the pot so we have some room to work with. And let's just add a pyro tag. So brand new scene file, adding the pyro. Let's hit play, see what we get. And we get some very large looking flame. And it's also, looks a little bit weird. It's probably colliding with this pot so you kind of get this big gap missing. So we got to change a lot of things here. Something I should note right now is it's entirely possible these types of settings, these big global settings, will change in the future. So even though this is going to be working right now in 2023.1, in the future, maybe these settings change. Because right now, you have to change quite a few things to make things work in a real-world scale. So anyway, let's begin by changing our overall scene scale. So I'll say Control-D. Let's go to the scene and I'll say, hey, my scene scale, I'm gonna make it one tenth the size. Essentially, that'll be the theme here, making things one tenth the size that they originally are. Having done that, I shall jump into our actual pyro object. And right now, these flames are really big. So let's make them way smaller. I'm gonna make it one tenth the size, so 0.5. We could hit play right now and see what we get. And you see, okay, we kind of get this giant burst of flame flying up. And I mean, it does look pretty, uh, pretty energetic there, but not exactly what I'm going for. But one thing that's going on is our actual grease fire here that we're making is very large. It's still making, it's emitting from a very large voxel size. So let's drop that way down. Again, 0.5, make that smaller. And now our surface thickness is right now 10 units above and 10 units below. Let's make that one tenth the size again. Rewinding, hitting play. Now what do we get? Well, now we've got a fire that's at least trapped within the pan. So that's looking a little bit better. Let's turn off the density, just focus on the fire for now, and see what that looks like. And we see we've got a burst of flame traveling upward. Now, something I've noticed is even though we've changed our scene scale and we've changed, and the scene scale does do things, and we've changed our voxel size to be way smaller, the way the gravity is working is still way too strong. So let's go back into our pyro object. Under extra forces, we've got a bunch of things involved with buoyancy. So here's how quickly it's going to travel upward. The hotter it is, the more it wants to travel up. And right now, the temperature buoyancy is saying it's going to go up by, I'm not sure what this multiplies by, but possibly by every unit of temperature, it's traveling up 0 0.045. So let's make it, I'm going to make that one-tenth the current amount. So I'll add a zero in front of the four. And we'll see what that does for us. So I said, okay, the temperature is going to go up one-tenth the speed because we scale everything down by 10. And now we're starting to get some pretty detailed-looking fire there. That looked pretty good. Okay, why did the flame kind of do that? Why is it kind of rippling all over the place? Well, that's actually happening for a very good reason, and we talked about that earlier. In order to demonstrate, let's make a plane. I don't want it to be too big. Let's move that up. And I'll move our pyro tag onto there, as easy as that. And now if I hit play, and I'll pause very quickly, you can see, oh, look, there are gaps in there. And we talked about the noise setting. So right now it's a very large noise, which sometimes is going to be covering the pan entirely and sometimes completely missing the pan. So selecting the pyro tag, I can say all the way at the bottom. Here's our noise. And the noise scales up at 25. So we can drop that to 2.5, one-tenth the number. And now rewinds, go forward a frame or two. And now you see, okay, now we've got a very small pattern. I still want that variation, especially on something violent like a grease fire. We want it kind of randomly moving around. And maybe we want it moving around like way quicker. I'll speed this up three times quicker. Drag that tag back to our grease, delete the plane, rewind, and we'll see what it looks like now. Hitting play. Now we get some flame. Ooh, that's starting to look pretty good. We've got something that feels about the right scale for this pan. Everything is now shrunk down. We get a nice, violent-looking flame that's trapped within the pan. So yeah, even right there, I'm quite pleased with where we are. But let's have a little extra fun and actually get some fuel in this. Because I'd love to get... You know, have you ever watched those like firefighter videos where they pour some water into a grease fire and you kind of get that burst of flame? So let's have this open with sort of a burst of flame. So we'll use fuel inside the pyro tag. Let's enable fuel. And right now you'll see it's set to continuous and it's setting it to 10. So we're going to be careful here, but if I play, we should get like almost a nuclear explosion coming out of this pan. Now the pot collider did a good job of stopping that from escaping down, but this is way too much. So let's drop it to one tenth the amount. I don't know if that'll be enough, but let's hit that. It's like, okay, it's a little bit smaller. But one thing I want to point out is currently fuel is set to continuous, which means it's constantly making more and more and more fuel. And you, in a lot of ways, you should think of fuel kind of like an explosion, like it's the fuel for an explosion. So this is way too much and it's going to be continuous, but I just want that first burst of it. So you could keyframe set and we could keyframe 
enable, but there's a cool setting inside of fuel type that we could say frame range. And I'm going to say I want it to emit from frame zero to frame one. So now we're just going to get a single frame of fuel. And after that, it disappears. Hitting play. Now you see I get that burst and then that should calm down. It's all burning away, but eventually that will calm down and we're going to be left with our original flame. So we got exactly one frame of explosion. That was very energetic right there. Probably a little more than I want. So let's rewind and move into our pyro settings. Now, a good rule of thumb here is don't change any setting unless you have to. You can play around all that you want with these settings. But in general, if you don't see a change, put it back. And if you don't have to change it, then don't change it. So we're going to be playing around a bunch with this combustion. So combustion is the way fuel will convert into fire and smoke. So, well, or density and temperature. So I'm going to say, don't worry about density at all. We already weren't dealing with fire. So let's just have this be a really clean flame. And now we see it, we get a fireball and then that eventually will fade. Now it takes a while. It seems like it's still generating a lot of flame as it goes. So I'm thinking that we've got a bunch of fuel and it's burning quite slowly. Potentially something we could do is crank up this burning rate. So it's going to eat up that fuel very quickly. So that might give us a bigger, actually it's just a solid little poof in the beginning, which actually is pretty much what I want. That actually worked better than I thought it would, quicker than I thought it would. You know, but, but I guess pay attention. If we put the burning rate down, there's a set amount of fuel there and it's going to keep burning and burning and burning kind of slowly. But now if I crank it up, then that fuel is burning very quickly. So we burn off the fuel, we get one poof, all the fuel's gone, and then it's done. Now, um, something I might be noticing is the collisions, or uh, you see it's kind of far away from the pan. You, there's one way of improving that right now. And if you go control, actually we're already here, scroll down under advanced settings. If you want slightly more accurate collisions, you can always turn on under advanced settings, turn on staggered velocities. Essentially, it just means there's going to be an increased resolution when it comes to how each voxel is calculating the collision. So that should just give us slightly better collisions. And I think some of the fire might be colliding and getting erased out. So now that I've done that, yeah, it's slightly bigger, definitely a bigger fireball now that we've changed that. But now I get that nice burst of flame I want in the beginning, and then we're left with a nice violent grease fire afterward that's just going to be playing and looking pretty good for real world scale. Now you could always decrease your voxel size even further, get more detail on that. We've got additional settings playing that we could play with like turbulence. In fact, right now our turbulence might be too large. I'm not sure. It's looking pretty good, but let's try shrinking that down to one tenth of the size as well. Essentially we've got an octave and it's set to two, but that's kind of our pre-scaled version. So I'll drop that down to one. And then essentially it's going to layer up noise on top of noise on top of noise, depending on how many uh, octaves you have. I'm going to say that each octave should go to 0.2. So essentially whatever I set one to, I set the others to. So not changing anything else. Let's rewind, hit play and see if it looks any different. So you get that nice little burst and let's see if the flames feel a little more detailed. Uh, it's hard to tell. No, I, I definitely think that these feel more detailed. We've scaled the noise down a little bit now, and we get a little bit more detail inside of that. Now, we could do things like crank up our turbulence. I'd like to do things by increments of 10, so we'll go 10 times stronger. Let's see if, like, if the turbulence was way strong. You can now see we get all this tiny little detail, and it's kind of obliterating kind of the uh, nice flowy turbulence we had. So I'll drop it back down to 5, just an experiment. We've got our vorticity, which I think does a lot for, like, making things curl but I'm kind of liking the way it looks already. So you know what? I'm actually feeling pretty good about that. If we wanted to, we could do things like create a turbulence. We could layer up additional flames. We could start activating our density, get some smoke in. But personally, I kind of like this very clean fire there. So I think that we'll let this wrap up the demo for kind of building a shrunk down, highly detailed grease fire. So let's jump into the next file. For our second project, let's move on to something a little more whimsical. So here's a thought. Let's make a fog curtain, which is going to pour out fog and it's going to flow down here. And as it passes by these pillars, they're going to take on the color of the pillars. So the setup I've got here is pretty straightforward. I've just got a bunch of cylinders to represent those. And then I've got a very simple spline that I'm creating this S curve, which I'm using to create these walls and this main waterfall platform. There's colliders on both of those. But besides that, you know, I'm going to hide the walls. And that's the only thing that's already set up. So we'll do the rest of it from scratch. 
And you can see kind of a figure here for the real world scale comparison. So here's our box right here. That's going to be generating the fog for us. Right clicking, I'll say simulation pyro. And right out of the gate, we don't want any temperature and there's no fuel. So pretty straightforward. And let's even turn off the noise. No noise. Hitting play. What do we get? Well, we get a little bit of smoke right around here, a little density. So I want that to fall downward. Hitting our pyro object, which is generated up at the top of the scene. I always move it down next to the main pyro generator, just because I'm quickly jumping between the settings of both. But moving to our pyro object, we've got under extra forces. We were doing temperature buoyancy a little bit ago, but now we're going to use density buoyancy. Now you'll see it's actually negative, and it's negative as compared to gravity. So we actually want it to go with gravity. So we could say, let's try 100, see what that looks like. Hitting play. Okay, it's definitely moving downward, but I think I want it to be maybe even more powerful there. So let's uh, push it up to, I don't know, around 200. Let's see what that does for us. And there we go. That's falling pretty well. Let's let that run for a little bit. I think we want some extra frames here, so I'll drag that up. And now you can see we've got this wall of fog sliding down, but it's fading away very quickly. We don't want it to fade away. So under the pyro object, the pyro simulation settings, we can scroll further down and you're going to see that we have a setting or category called dissipation. But here's our density dissipation and it's currently erasing out like 7% of the density, I think every frame, possibly every second, but I think every frame. So let's say zero. I don't want any of that to fade away. You've also got the absolute density dissipation. So instead of it being a relative thing that it's losing 7% every frame, now it's losing a global amount. I'm going to get rid of that too. So zero. So there's no dissipation anywhere for any of that. And then, well, let's just hit play on that and see how that looks. So that now falls. Seems very dense right now, but that's now falling. It's twirling around very nicely, but you see it's not disappearing anymore. Very thick, but that's crashing through the wall, looking pretty good. We've got very high gravity, so the hope here is with only high gravity, yep, it's doing a very nice job of following that curve down. So there we go. Very nice thick fog. Let's simplify a bunch of this stuff. Let's move up. And right now it's very, there's a lot of turbulence and the turbulence is causing this to kind of drift apart. It's not very thick. So let's get rid of all of our turbulence. So say zero. Let's see how that looks. So with nothing shaking that up, this now falls down. It looks a little bit more uniform. And you know what? We've got vorticity and that does a, usually does a nice job of breaking things apart like smoke it adds like nice roughness to the edges but you know what i'm just gonna say zero vorticity so nothing we're trying to keep this as coherent as we can so now as that falls down we're getting this lovely wave kind of twirling around and it's it's staying way more kind of clumped up as that is flowing down yeah nice solid wall of fog falling through there so i like that way better now it's very thick it's very dark so let's go back to our pyro tag and say Yes, fuel, or I'm sorry, yes, uh, yes, we want density, but it's really strong. So we can go down to one, perhaps, and let's see what we get. Okay, definitely a lighter fog. I love this roll motion that we're getting. Might be a little thin. I can definitely see it thinning out here. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll go up a bunch. Let's go up to four for now. Rewind to do it again. This fog is constantly being generated, so constant new smoke being generated for us. But it's flowing down very nicely, swirling around. So let's start with that. That's looking pretty good. We always bring some turbulence back in again later when we know that we want it. But we got a nice solid fog crashing through there. We might want to lighten that up in a little bit, but this is a good start. So here's a thought. I want to have, when it passes through one of these pillars, I want to take on the color of the pillar. So I'll select this yellow one, right click and add a simulation pyro tag. I don't want it to change the density. I don't want to add any temperature. I don't want to affect the velocity. So we've really simplified this and let's even turn off noise. It shouldn't be having any effect any, anywhere. Essentially the only thing that's happening is this is going to change the color. So I'm going to say, hey, when any fog touches this yellow pillar, it should turn yellow, just like in an early example that we did. Also, it's currently set to surface emitter. I'm going to turn that off so it's actually seeing the entire volume of it. So having done that, let's hit play and see. It's a very thin pillar right now, so I'm hoping we see just at least a little bit of yellow. So let that play through. It's going to come and crash into it, and let's see what we get. 
Oh, okay, look at that. We got a very nice stripe of yellow there. So pretty much exactly what we're hoping for. But it's very thin. So you know what? I want these pillars to be nice and thin to kind of represent that the fog can pass in between them. We could make it collide, but I'm thinking let's just make a duplicate of these and fake it. So I'll make a duplicate. Delete that tag from the bottom one. So these are the ones we're going to see, but these are the ones we're going to actually collide with. Selecting all of those cylinders, I'll just increase the radius until maybe they're slightly intersecting just to make sure we catch everything. And then I want to still kind of see them visually represented. So I'll right click and add a render display and show only the line. So we can see those, we're reminded of them, make sure they don't render. And then the you know last thing, I'll pull these all forward so that they don't begin until kind of the proper pillar begins. Now let's see what that does. I keep in mind, well, I'm just going to hit play to continue here. Keep in mind, we're only seeing what's happening with the yellow one. So we're definitely getting, okay, we're now definitely getting a way wider stream of yellow. Now I definitely think it's very dark still. So even though it's turning yellow, it's, it's still, it's a dark yellow. So we'll pull back on the fog generation density. So I'll drop that down to two. And maybe we'll give it some initial velocity. So I'm going to say set an absolute movement to minus one on y, x, y, z. So minus one down. And I want to fling the smoke downward. So right now, hard to tell. I'm going to go up to a thousand, which is probably too much. But let's see what that does. A thousand. Um, you know what? Not too bad. Ooh, look at that wave. Oof. So it's flinging the smoke down very quickly, which is creating this large vortex. And it is creating a couple imperfections there. Kind of like that. I think it's a little strong, but now we got a giant wall coming through. I think eventually this wall would fade away and we'll get something a little more consistent. Essentially, this is beginning a flow, giving it somewhere to travel, but that's looking pretty cool. But let's drop this to maybe half the amount. That's flinging it down very fast. So I'll drop this down. Still got that nice wave. The initial velocity is nice. Oh, that's gorgeous. But let's let this spin around. I just want to, I don't want it to go too high, even if it does calm down eventually. And you know, a little vorticity, a little turbulence would probably be nice. We're still getting a large wall, but you know what? I'm gonna say that we keep it, but let's go a little bit further and just see how well the yellow stripe comes through. I'm not sure if it's an optical illusion or if there's some sort of issue because if, I swear there's a little bit of blue before the yellow begins. But this yellow is looking way more yellow because it's not as dense. So I like the look of that. So I'm going to colorize the rest of these. So I'll probably speed this up for you so you don't have to watch. But the basic idea is I'm going to copy this tag up, select the pillar. This one is the orange one, and I'll just set this color to orange. One thing to note is... Uh, I found you have to be very saturated with these colors and something like this orange, like I'm going to go way closer to red than orange, which is, I, I, it just makes it a nicer orange, but uh, I'll speed this up. All those should be colorized now. Let's let the wall of fog come down and see how that interacts as all of the fog is going to be forced to change color unless it somehow sneaks above it. So nice cloud. It, is just via moving, dissipating a little bit. But let's see, as it comes through, definitely see some purple there. Okay, yep, colors are looking nice. I'm gonna visually hide those pillars that we made. So now we just see the colors and there we go. Look at this like giant cascade of rainbow colors as it's bursting past these pillars. So, oh man, that's looking great. I mean, the point here is like, yeah, it's pyro and it makes really great flame and smoke, but you don't have to, you don't have to think of it that way. Here I am using it to create uh, different bursts of color and like this colored fog as it flows through, taking on these different properties and these will flow down. The gravity should be pulling all these downward. You definitely see it following this curve down. After that initial burst, you can see these all calm down. So I imagine this overall wave will go a little bit slower. So I could imagine, you know, we could add turbulence in, which could help a lot. We could have the initial burst be a little bit lighter. We could have these not accelerate in quite as fast. So you don't get that initial burst. I kind of liked it. Um, and then maybe throwing some additional turbulence in here would be nice. But yeah, I just want to throw out some of this cool effect of just making colored smoke. Like so much fun to... Uh, to play with that. Let's work on this one from scratch. First of all, I'll make a plane, make it a little bit bigger, and then go to our asset browser and search for the Stegosaurus. Yes, Stegosaurus. 
So the elephant leaves a stegosaurus this time. And we'll leave it at its current scale. But you know what? I would like to remesh it. The mesh is, isn't too bad here. That would totally work. But let's throw this into a builder. Throw that into a mesher. What I've been doing is we can actually go decently overboard here. Make this smaller and inflate this a bit. That tends to help with those really thin plates. So I don't want to go so far that these intersect each other, but I want to be detailed enough. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. And honestly, these stegosaurus should probably get subdivided, so we'll throw that into a subdivision surface first. And that needs a little more inflation. Let's make, oh, put that above. There we go. So there we go, excellent. That's looking good. So I will make that editable and then feed the entire thing into a remesh which I'll say I want to drop down to, let's say, 25%. It's probably not quite enough, and I'll drop the adaptiveness way down as well. It's probably not quite enough, but we can make this one editable and throw it into a second remesh, and that one will go even quicker. So let this one process all the way through, and I think we'll get a nice-looking mesh from that, but it does take a little bit of time. But yeah, that's looking great. But I will make that editable, throw that into another remesh, but this one will go even quicker. Drop that down to 25%. I'm going to want this pretty low poly lower the adaptiveness. I want the poly kind of, the uh, poly distribution to be relatively even here. And yeah, that's looking pretty good. Lower would probably run even quicker, but you know what? I think we work with this. So I will make that editable just so that the remesh doesn't accidentally have to recalculate at some point. And let's take the plane. I'm going to spin it 45 degrees just for fun. T for scale. Make it big enough so it's catching the stegosaurus. And um, let's rename this dino. And... What I would like to do in this file as we go through, and you know what, let's save it just in case I lose this. Let's say this is a giant model at a museum or something. It's going to catch on fire, and as it catches on fire, the whole thing is going to collapse. So, dino, dino. Let's add a collider tag onto the ground here. And on the dino, we'll add a cloth. And a couple of different things we want to do. First of all, probably pull the dyno just slightly up so it's not intersecting the ground. Change some settings. Let's get the bendiness. Drop that down to zero. Soft body. We're definitely going to need this. Turning that on is going to create a whole bunch of connections inside of it. And we'll limit the length. Where's the length? That target length and maximum. Here's maximum length. Increase this. And I want it so that we don't get any poles that are shooting like all the way across the dinosaur. They can go pretty far, but not all the way. And I might even create a couple extra connections and add a little more angle. The idea is we just want it to be very structural. And hopefully, if I hit play, this will fall to the ground. And you see the dinosaur, it's not quite standing. I want it to stand a little bit more. So let's make sure we can get that going. I'll also make it sticky. So we'll add two sticky to it. And we'll make the ground sticky. So the feet will stick to the ground. And then the soft body, currently the softness is quite high but we'd probably put that down low so this gets very that'll get more rigid yet now it's not falling over the tail falls to the ground but you see the dino is continuing to stand mostly upright technically we could interconnect a couple extra pieces but i think this is going to work well enough for our purposes now you'll notice that the tail flops straight down so here's my thought we're going to do a lot of the burning effect or where it's going to burn we're going to do this with vertex maps so creating a, we're going to make a fire eventually, and the fire will come from this sphere. But for now, I'll say that if the dino, well, the, we'll take the dino, add a other tag, and the other will be a vertex map. And on the vertex map, I'll say use fields, and we will use a freeze, but not yet. The thought is, if it passes through the spherical field, then, and let's see, if I go... Right now it's looking at the points, so that should be fine. If I go frame, 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 frame. Right there, you see how it's starting to turn yellow? So here's a thought. If we make a freeze now, and I'll say freeze, set that to add. Here's the usual formula for a nice growth. Freeze, add, I would like it to grow. And what's a good size here? I'll make a cube, just to get a baseline. That's a cube, so, you know, 10, maybe 20, you know, these are maybe 10 apart, just eyeballing it. So I want to grow a lot more than that. In fact, I want probably a long transitional 
range. So I'm gonna put this all the way up to like 100, which is kind of crazy huge, but then effect strength way down at like five. I'm just guessing at numbers here. So let me play and see what that does. So you can see here that we've got this growth traveling along, but there's a really soft gradient that shows it. I might honestly go further. I'm gonna do 200 and 2%. So now we're gonna get this very soft growth traveling through it. And that gives us a really long transition time. So now, something I, I hadn't realized in the past, but now that I've got this radius down at 2%, the uh, sphere coming in at 100% is going to mess things up. So I'll make a solid, lower that to the bottom. And solid is just like saying all, like everything is 0%, but it's at the bottom. And now I'll say that sphere is coming in, but that sphere is going to come in at only 2%. So I don't know for sure if that will work, but let's see. Oh, and we also have to click the freeze and clear because otherwise it was remembering that initial condition so let's see if that is working it looks like i need to go a little bit higher than that blending five percent we need an, okay there see that was enough to trigger now you see we get this nice soft gradient starting to grow up now we need quite a few more frames because we have this growing really slowly but now you can see we've got this slow gradient that's slowly passing through the entire dinosaur and it's going a little bit faster and then eventually yeah it's doing a pretty good job of over the course of this time covering the entire thing now we could add variation on there it, it can actually be fun to add in a random field set that to normal and get a good pattern so field different type of noise let's do i don't know Naki, Luca, Luca can be good. Make it large enough so we can actually see the pattern pretty distinctly. Maybe something like that. And we'll give it some animation speed, just so we can cover everything. And now that can be fed into the radius. So now it's slowly, well, it's telling certain parts to be affected more or less. That'll slow everything down in general, like quite a bit. So typically, once I put a noise in, I'll ab about double the effect strength. Let's see what that does. So the hope is this will still grow, but the, I want to see a slightly imperfect pattern. Yeah, you see it's getting up onto that scale before it got here. So one side is being affected, the toe fell behind. You see how the pattern's a little more broken up? So that was the goal there. So we've now got this range of initial growth passing through, just doing vertex map stuff in soft body. So now let's name this tag, always a good idea. So let's just say, um, I'll just call that the ramp. So now I'll make a second vertex map. In the second vertex map, let's delete everything out. I don't need any of those other references. But I do want this initial tag to come in. Very important to rename the tag. They have to have different names. So I'll call this one Flame. So right now, this is going to transfer over directly. It's going to do the nearest. You can even set that to index. So like literally the same points are coming over. It's a good way of blurring things though. But anyway, now it's coming through. But now I can do something like create a curve. And using this curve, I'll pull this over into the middle and make a third point. So now you'll actually see that what I'm getting is remapping that gradient that was kind of fading from zero up to 100. Now I'm remapping it to fade from zero up to 100 and then back down to zero again. We actually make this pretty strong, like making more of the effect up near the top. So now we're going to get this nice range from one side to the other. And you know, let's see how I want to map this because the gradient's not ma falling off the quite the way I thought it would. Yeah, we'll tighten that up a little bit. So essentially what the goal is, is I'm making a band, like a stripe. And the stripe is kind of organically growing through the dinosaur. And wherever this is, is where the burning effect is going to be. I can use this to remap if you want. You can go pure black and white by setting a quantize, dropping that down to zero. And now essentially some, it's looking at all the values below. So either it's on or it's off. So this is where the fire is. So this is like full power fire that would be traveling through here. Keep in mind, we've done nothing with pyro yet, but now we have the effect going through. It's very fast, but we don't want this to take forever to play through, so I'll leave it going extra quick. I probably want this to be like a tenth the speed if we were going like realistic, depending on what the uh, material was supposed to be on the dinosaur. Now we've got that ramp passing through. So we, you know, setting up the burning on here should be pretty straightforward, but let's do some additional effects as well using more of the cool simulation stuff that we have. And these are all things that were established in the previous two versions. If I make another copy of this tag, I can say that I want to, let's remap it again, but this time, and let me hit play a little bit so we can get part of the range. 
let's have that go about halfway. So now this could be uh, this can be where it's already burnt. We could say that this is maybe it starts becoming bendy. So I'm going to pull this up a little bit. And this vertex map can say that that area is 0% bendy. And this stuff will be somewhat bendy. So let's try that. Inside, let's call it that. Let's call it bend. And inside of our tag, I'm going to say that as the bend passes through, the surface can be bendy. I'll say that this is, I don't know, let's go probably overboard, 55, very bendy. But now I'm going to say it's only bendy where that tag says it's bendy. And I don't know what that will do, but let's hit play. And now hopefully, let's click on the tag so we can see what it's doing. That's passing through. Now that's saying it's bendy. And you can actually see, yeah, look at the, the scales, like kind of fall over. So if those are burning, those would start falling over. And now the entire thing is flopping over because of how bendy it is. But most of what we're seeing right now is from the structure. It's from the what is called soft body. So we got these poles going across and connecting everything. But that also has a setting called softness that we can feed a vertex map. So I'm going to say that this is very soft. And I'm going to try a thousand, which honestly might be too weak. But let's do a thousand and say bend. And now as that passes through, it's going to start making those poles bendy, essentially saying that they can flex. And now you can see that these are starting to flex a little bit, and that's bending over definitely more than it was before. And now the entire thing is starting to flop over and fall apart. Let me try jumping this up to 10,000 just to see if that makes a difference. And actually, yeah, it totally does. So let's go 10,000. So now it's, like it's totally solid. And now it's saying, oh, it's getting softer and softer and more and more bendy. So now deselecting it, we see... As, in theory, the fire is burning through it, it's also affecting the overall model. So now if I click on what should be the burning stripe, let's see how that is comparing to what's falling apart. So that's on fire, that's on fire. And you see how it's shriveling as the parts that would be on fire are going down. Like I said, again, this whole thing's sort of in fast forward, but that's looking pretty good. And the whole thing eventually flops over. Finally, let's just, it's going to be very similar to the original one, but I'll make another duplicate of the original one. And let's just call this one burnt. And this one, very similar, uh, but we won't quantize. And this time, we will change the ramp a little bit to pull these back. I should probably play through. But just to compare, here's the idea of the burnt area is we want to change the material. So let's look at what the fire is doing. So here's the fire, and currently the fire, I'll pause it right as it's kind of halfway. Oop, I missed. Pause it right there as it's kind of passing through. So that's kind of where that is. So I select where it's burnt. Now you can see that the burning is happening a little bit earlier. I'm going to pull this more forward, heavier contrast. Essentially, I want this to be right at that midpoint between the two. So right when the fire is kind of at the halfway point. Uh, but of course, you could push even farther forward. Like things actually start burning a little bit ahead of the flame so it can burn. So we can push that to whatever degree we want. Okay, that's looking fine. Uh, this whole thing eventually would be Redshift. So I'll give this a save and set this to Redshift so I can create a Redshift material. And if I didn't mention this earlier, something important to note is the Redshift materials are working way better in the viewport for giving more information. So I'll create a Redshift standard material, which is now at the top of the list, which is very nice. Apply that before I forget. And inside the dyno, let's make a vertex attribute and that should hopefully be pretty straightforward that it will take on the burnt attribute and if I feed this out we'll keep it simple here I'll just feed that out to the color channel and you can now see that we've got black and white I want the opposite there isn't an invert here I, I guess I could just go into my tag and invert we could also invert it with a ramp here so we've got whatever options we want but I will just invert it here in my tag because it'll be a little bit quicker and now you can see that this is now black and that part's white. We can colorize it however we want, but that's a nice simple way of doing this. Excellent. So now if I hit play, now it's just on the material. So now we're seeing a vertex map live in the viewport represented, which is great. And a bunch of other things got applied that way. So yeah, again, I'm doing all these attributes as if this was burning and melting, but we haven't even added the fire to it yet. But now that we've done all that prep work, now I think we can go and actually add the pyro in giving that another save because it's looking good. I will actually apply the fire to the dinosaur. Simulation pyro. Now, um, what am I thinking? We could just do straight up fuel. I mean, if we want to keep this running quick, especially here for a demo, it would probably be good just to turn off density and run this directly with fire to, you know, right on the model. But we could also have this be burning fuel and 
the entire thing could be catching on fire. Vi- I mean, the sphere could be on fire and then catch the fuel on fire, and the fuel would slowly travel across it. A lot of different options. But anyway, let's keep it simple. We've got temperature. We've got flame. That's where it should be burning. And we don't even have to add. I'll just say set the amount. So by itself, let's see what that does. It is currently set to be only on the surface. And we've got a relatively low voxel size. But keep in mind, this dinosaur is very large. So now that has triggered on the vertex map. And now we've got some flame beginning to spread. So uh, I fully expect to see a warning pop here, pop up here in a little bit, and we'll deal with it when it pops up. But so far, that's looking really good. We've got this fire going, and you know, as soon as the fire is done, you see this area has already been burnt. So let this continue through. The fire seems to, I would like it to be maybe a little more powerful and bright. I want it to be traveling upward more. We've kind of got default settings here. And maybe a little fuel would, would enable it to keep going up. I'm not too worried about that yet. Let's just take, give it a little bit of time. You see everything's going to run way slower now that Pyro's going. And Pyro does have to kind of calculate the entire model. There's going to be a tree that uh, the tree structure. Let's select the Pyro tag. Scroll down. And I can turn on for a second this draw tree structure. You see that it's quite large. And like I said, the bigger your tree structure, the more time it's going to take to calculate. Now, it's, it is actually traveling pretty slow, so we might be able to tweak a couple settings here that I haven't talked about. For instance, I could scroll up, and we've got at the top tree settings. We've got a setting called padding. Essentially, this is trying to make sure that everything's going to calculate correctly, so it's actually making an extra box, and then beyond that extra box, an extra box, just to make sure everything's getting captured. If you're relatively confident that your fire's not traveling too crazy or too fast, we can definitely drop that down to one. And hopefully that would, yeah, you can now see that all that has shrunk down a little bit, which should speed up everything. So I, I do that almost every single file is dropping that down to a, a padding of one. And yeah, now we're getting slightly quicker playback. Scrolling down, we can turn that tree back off again. Now we see the fire continue to pass through. Oh no, the poor stegosaurus. But keep in mind, this is, just a, this is a model of a stegosaurus in the museum, not an actual stegosaurus. So continues to burn, working quite well. Um, so yeah, that's looking great. Uh, like I said, I might want to do some additional things. Right now, the voxels are, they're very large. The fire would look more realistic if we shrink voxel size. That's going to take way too long. Me playing back in the viewport here. And we didn't get the VRAM warning. But if you do a very big amount of fire, it's entirely possible to get a VRAM warning. And if you don't have enough VRAM, like you're, you're kind of limited in your simulation size. And then the easy way of fixing that is just increasing your voxel size until it's, it can work. And we didn't play too much with substeps, but essentially, if you need more detail, increasing your substeps is a good idea. Um, just throwing out some additional settings. If you're doing some things with field forces, you can slightly increase these numbers um, to get more resolution, but typically that shouldn't even need to be touched. Maybe I'll put some fuel in here. I'm not sure if it's a good idea or not, but let's go back to the actual pyro generation. And under fuel, I'll say yes. And I'm going to go easy on it. So it's going to be continuously making fuel. And I'm also going to say that that fuel is limited to where the flame will be i guess it's going to start immediately as soon as i hit play so let's see yeah immediately you see we're getting more of a burst of flame so let's just see how that uh i mean it sort of appears there so that's very powerful that's a lot so i'm going to pull back on that also the flame is generating smoke and actually smoke is pretty cool like i would definitely want some smoldering action going here but we can turn off the smoke for our combustion under combustion settings so i'll say no density per fuel and let's rewind and see if we can get the first couple frames going here and just see what the, you know, there's fuel here now. So there should be more fire. It's burning slowly. So it's going to be tending to want to go up higher. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, these flames are definitely lasting longer in this particular scenario. And you can see why I wanted it to burn through so quickly because it's going to take a while for this entire animation to play through. But that's looking pretty good. Yeah, I mean, Pyro does ooh, look a big burst of the uh, fuel traveling upward. Now, I am curious if we do get the VRAM warning, if it goes like very large. Um, and then if it does, if, if it does, then it'll be a great time to mention one more trick that I have for speeding things up or making it so that it's not going to take quite as much of your VRAM. I'll mention it one way or the other, but let's give it the opportunity to get to a problem. No. Yeah, it's looking great. Um, 
Yeah, a lot of different things we do right now. We did do that very heavy contrast, so it's either on or off. But those those could have been a gradient, and that there'd be more or less fuel as it travels across. That'd probably be a good idea because I feel like I'm seeing the shape of the vertex map a little bit too strongly here. It's going quick enough that that might be fine. Uh, some smoke on here, like I said, would be great. But look at all these different layers just working instantly together. And being able to design everything via those vertex maps beforehand to art direct everything. That There's so many different ways I could be layering up different noises or having lag behind it. We could crank up that noise and have certain parts burn across faster or slower. You could paint vertex weights. So you could be like, I want it to go quicker here, slower here. Like so many different options. They, there's, there are a lot more things that Pyro does that I haven't even gotten into. It's all like project based, but there are things like this fluid force where you can actually make it so that, uh, say, a soft body object would be getting pushed around by the heat. We could take the Pyro, if we told the actual Pyro object to output these different bits of data, you can actually feed that out into a field so you can actually have the field forces push in a particular direction or not. And actually, I just remembered, I'll probably pop open a demo scene file to show one last thing. Because uh, there's another cool thing you do with vertex maps. But, yeah, look at that. Poor, poor thing. Burns through quickly. Uh, and then once, once this vertex map has gone all the way through, then it'll all the fire will just turn off. In a practice run I had done of this, well, actually in my own time when I was learning how to use Pyro... Uh, I had a, another vertex map that was leaving like some smoldering smoke on the mesh after it had gone past all of it. And yeah, we could be, de you know, there's so many different ways of deforming the stuff. We could use a, a displacer and it could limit it to a vertex map. So these could be, be all like fried and charred by a displacing different areas. We could be applying entirely different materials in different areas on here. But yeah, that's looking pretty great. Very, very pleased with that. Now, two things. One thing to mention is there's a lot of accuracy when it comes to the pyro stuff. Now, if you take a look here, it's going to be subtle, but you see how this is sort of, you know, the entire thing is you know, very bright and eventually it fades out to almost nothing. If, especially when you're doing tests, some of that extra information, like even here, there's going to be more pyro information like over here, which is outside the threshold that we can see. And maybe even here, like maybe we don't care about like this very, very light orange area. So if you are running out of VRAM, you get that warning. Something you do is go down to your, where is it here, thresholds. And you can say to just not worry about calculating something once it gets past a certain point. So we know when this fire is getting born, it's like more than 4,000 in temperature. So I could say, you know what? And actually the number I've been going for is a 777. So I'm going to say anything if it's if it's not at least seven 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 in heat, then just don't worry about calculating it. And that means all of those the trees, the voxels are going to shrink down. We don't need as much. Now, if I hit play in a frame, I just wonder if this is going to disappear. Yeah, you see, suddenly a bunch of those disappeared. So we can get a smaller, quicker to calculate flame by changing those thresholds. Now I went from one to almost eight hundred. So obviously you could do a way smaller threshold, but uh, just a way of making things go a little bit faster. You can do the same thing with your density or your velocities. Keep all that in mind. There's so many additional layers, but I know this video is going to be crazy long. Um, while we're here, I wanted to maybe pop open the animation. So just so you can see it in real time, here was a viewport render of the same setup. Uh, this one had a little bit of smoke in there. Just letting that play through. And the whole thing melts down. Yeah, we got pretty similar in this one. And you can see the smoldering smoke that I put as a separate layer on there. So, yeah, it's super fun to be able to lay that kind of thing. And, yeah, that'll wrap that one up. And then we won't worry about making this one from scratch. But if I pop this open, you'll see that I've got a head here. And I am creating a cloud of smoke. And it's just kind of bouncing around inside the head. There's a camera spinning around. And, yeah, so the idea is it's just filling up this entire volume slowly. And you see you get really cool forms. And I keyframed the density. So if we go to the sphere, you can see that this density's color is slowly changing over time. And th this will fade slowly. And there's some different turbulences and whatnot that's making it disperse. But you see how it's bouncing around, making all these cool shapes. But the main thing I want to show was, we'll just pause this at some moment here. Give that a pause. And now you see I'm actually feeding this density into, you can, 
before we fed into a mesher, but you can, you can feed it into a builder. And now that's in the builder, we can do things like modify the fog and smooth it out and grow it, probably change this to a fog mode. You can feed it from one to the other. You don't have to, but I am now meshing all of this. And let me delete this tag so we can talk about it. So if I tell the pyro to output and you see it's outputting the density, that's creating the ability for the volume to create this mesh at all. But now I'm going to say, hey, also output the color. So now, actually, we probably do that separately. So I'm going, I'll do it from scratch. So right now we're outputting density, but now I'll make a duplicate of this object. And this one, I'm going to say, don't output the density. I want this one to output just the color. So it's like a separate model, a separate object of pyro information that's outputting the color of the density, the color of the smoke. So I'll visually hide it because I don't need to see it. But now that's what's outputting color. Selecting our vertex or our volume measure, I can right click and say other tag, create a vertex color. And because this can work on parametric objects now, I can say, hey, vertex map, use your fields to reference the pyro density. And now as, I, as soon as I drag that over, now the color of those clouds is being transferred onto the mesh. Now you're gonna get some of these kind of fighting each other a little bit, but a good trick would be making a second copy of the color. And I'll drag the first one in. And this time I'll say, hey, I want you to average your colors as you transfer over. Oh, and also very, very important. Make sure you change the name of one of the tags. Otherwise, it doesn't know how to transfer. So now that is transferring over the color. It's a very large average. So let's just start ticking this up slowly. And you see right there, right as I go up just a little bit, I can blur those. So now we get the average color. And now I've got that mesh colorized. Like, look at this volume. Like, how would we ever make something like this? in the past um, and here it is in vanilla cinema and if i let's see is it set up currently to yeah i'm gonna say simulate before generators i'm not sure how well this will play but in a risky way i hit play and yeah now it's going to continue to actually that's actually playing back better than i thought it would it is now growing and changing here and this is just throwing in the most generic version like we could be remapping these values multiple things bouncing around the side more turbulences um, like so many, so many different things we could be layering up on top of this. So, yeah, that's looking great. Very, very fun. So many things to explore when it comes to pyro. But all good things must come to an end. So I'm going to have to wrap up this pyro section, which is also going to be wrapping up this video of all of the new features inside of Cinema 4D. 2023.1 keep in mind that this is just a point one release we just got 2023 not that long ago so yeah maxon's really been cranking out the new features and all the simulation stuff has been looking incredible so that'll wrap this up thank you so much everybody for watching keep an eye out for upcoming live streams but other than that thank you for watching and i'll see you next time bye bye